I'm Jubal. I work at uh, Microsoft on the Big Maps team. Um, I'm relatively new from Microsoft. It's been about uh, just about a year and a half. Um, and when I tell people I work on the Big Maps team, I've gotten used to about two responses. The first one is usually, does Steve Coast work there? And the, the second one is, I thought they sold you to Uber. Uh, and so I'm here to say that the team is alive and well, and so I figured I should title my slide, Here Comes Microsoft Again, because we've been here before. Um, so I, I'm really just going to give you an overview of some of the thinkings around uh, OpenStreetMap within the company um, and some of the challenges we're having uh, about introducing OpenStreetMap uh, sort of in a big way, um, and then sort of what, you know, what keeps me up at night. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, the sort of we have a long uh, history of mapping at Microsoft, and if you're old like me, you've been through a lot of this and you've seen a lot of these developments. Um, it's been pretty stable for the last few years. We've got lots of good customers, um, and things are just sort of humming along at, at, at a reasonable pace. And to give you a better sense of actually where I sit within the organization, um, I work right at the front of where the location data feeds into the data store. And so some of the things you see in BingMaps.com, routing, geocoding, um, reverse geocoding, rendering, or sort of the, some of the byproducts that come out of our team. Um, but a lot of what we do is serve our internal customers. So that's uh, Skype, uh, the Bing Search, Windows, Excel, Power BI. So a lot of the requirements that come from our team are actually come from deep within Microsoft. And each one of these teams has its own legal team. They have their own requirements. They have their own customers. Um, so we have to be cognizant of when we put data into the very top of the pipeline about the tens of thousands of customers that we could potentially impact. Um, so some of the contributions that we've done over the years, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Bing imagery. Um, so according to our calculations, around 35 or 36 percent of the uh, edits have a source of uh, Bing imagery, and this is great. We're really happy to see Digital Globe and Esri recently follow us into this to sort of create this reach ecosystem, so that's awesome. Um, we, we just contributed uh, almost 10 million building footprints just this, just this last year with a height attribute. Um, so those are sitting out there licensed under ODBL, ready for import into uh, for the OSM community. Certainly there's an import process that needs to be followed, but that data is out there for everybody to use. Um, we have this great uh, internal program called uh, Benevity Program. Basically anytime somebody Somebody spends an hour mapping outside of work. Microsoft contributes 25 bucks. Um, so my friend, uh, my colleague, Alex Kazakova and I sort of run the missing maps program within the Bing org, and then we've spread this um, across to Azure and multiple teams within philanthropy. So um, we're continuing to sort of scale this out in a big way. So when you first come across open data, uh, when I showed up, it was about a year and a half ago. Um, this is sort of the general reaction. Yeah, this is going to be fantastic. We love it. This is going to be easy. Let's just go for it. And then we run into this. <laughs> Um, and so this is what I put in front of the Microsoft legal team um, about how we're going to navigate this, um, this set of wikis, these pages, all these talk forms, and, and um, they get, uh, um, they usually end up like this. Um, but for OSM, I mean, we didn't just say, well, the ODB li ODBL license is too restrictive, um, but we're trying to figure out what we can and can't do. So some of the things we can't do with OSM is comply with local laws. That's a problem. Uh, in some places of the world have rules about how you can display data, how you can manage it. Um, if you're in China, Taiwan is not a country. Um, and so we have things that uh, may not impact the armchair mappers, but have a serious impact for Microsoft. Um, we can't make bulk updates. Um, so there are some countries in the world, if a new administration takes over, that all the street names have to change. We can't just do that in OSM. Um, we can't conflate data. So we can mix and match data with compatible license sources and engineer our way around this problem, but we can actually combine this data um, to create new and different exciting data sources. Uh, and we can't sue someone. Uh, there's nobody to sue. I can't sue Kate. There's no money um, to be gotten there. So if somebody sues us, we, have, we can't turn that around and sue somebody. That's a problem. Um, and we can't pay money to make this all go away. So I can't license the OSM database for $20 million so I can do whatever I want. There's nobody to pay it to. Um, the, 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 the data is a, a resource for everybody. Um, so some of the things we're sort of working on, we are doing some very early prototypes around uh, deep, learning, uh, deep learning models uh, using our internal GPU cluster, uh, CNTK, which is an open source framework for deep learning to do some building footprint extraction. And the challenge we put, it in, put in front of ourselves is actually can we create a building footprint which is indistinguishable from a human edit. Um, we are doing some prototyping with side by side. So one of these sides is Bing Maps, one of these sides is OSM in a Bing style. I'll let you try to figure out which one it is. Okay, that's all the time you get. So the things that keep me awake at night, uh, vandalism. So where I'm absolutely terrified of vandalism, we ran a really simple, really simple uh, filter through that and came up with some examples of data that's been in the database for years and nobody has noticed. Um, and we're worried about sort of the, you know, the overt vandalism, but also the more subtle forms of vandalism, like changing uh, default language tags and moving boundaries around and things like that will cause a real problem for Microsoft. 
Infrastructure, oh, I worry about infrastructure all the time. Um, so for somebody like Microsoft, we have to worry about uh, directed, organized, targeted attacks, and would the OSM infrastructure um, be able to handle it? Um, we worry about scale. So as we see more users going up, and uh, you know, we see the actual percentage of users actually contributing to around 1%, but what happens if this goes up 10 times? That's an issue. Um, and finally, we are worried about land use equals grass. Um, we don't know what it is. It's not a park. I can't map it to anything in our ontology. Um, I can map Central Park, but all the grass within it comes out blank. So um, those are just some of the things. Um, anyway, that's my five minutes. I'll take some questions after the end if there is any. Um, thank you very much. Um, and we, there's seven of us here, that's here the last couple of days, so definitely try to find us if you have some more questions. All right. Thanks. I think that was the very definition of lightning. <laughs> okay, next up is Tim. If Microsoft comes, then they really come all at the same time. So there, here is Tim. All right, all in. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim. I'm uh, also a program manager on Bing Maps, um, and this talk is uh, the mappings between the map uh, between the maps. Um, so what does what does that really mean? That means we want to connect the dots. Uh, we look at a lot of different What's that? Oh, no. I'll give you extra time. Sweet. Yeah, that's, that's really good. So um, we work with a whole bunch of different uh, data sets, and we really want to be able to line them up, uh, get the connections, and uh, see where they, they agree and disagree. Um, so at a really high level, I'll just jump through a really quick example. Uh, here's a city of Boulder in uh, OSM. Uh, we want to make a kind of a logical map between that uh, and say, uh, here's the same entity and who's on first. Um, some subtle differences, they might have some different metadata, but it's ultimately the same entity. Uh, we can take it one step further. Here's you know, uh, the wiki article for that. It might have some useful information. What we don't want um, you know, is uh, an article about large rocks. Uh, I like how wiki decides to point that out. Um, a more legitimate example is we wouldn't want um, a county called Boulder. It might even be in the same place. So this is what, what the wants and don't wants for, for all this matching. Um, so our quick little lightning talk, four-step easy recipe to get good matches uh, is what I'll walk through very briefly. Uh, we need to bring everything down into kind of a uniform format. Um, that's keeping data that's relevant to matching uh, and normalizing it so that you know, everything can talk together. Uh, additionally, it, there might be some gaps. Not all data sources have the same degrees of richness, so we can actually pull out some things. For uh, the, the wiki example, we actually start crawling through the article text to find out additional information, you know, uh, hierarchies, types, things that might not be good in the, the wiki data blob, uh, which is all too common. Next up, we want to figure out what all the best matches are. So we put this all into a soup, and we go through a, a whole number of features um, looking at all sorts of things in the data, from the hierarchy to the geometry to the attributes. Um, and uh, that can get complicated when you're looking at everything in the world. Uh, so as is the common topic uh, this weekend, uh, machine learn all the things. Um, so we train uh, models to determine the, uh, the relevant weights to all these scores uh, and determine all these matches. So what can we do with this? We have tons of matches all around the world of all sorts of types. Uh, well, we do a whole lot of things with it. Uh, measurements galore, uh, this is our bread and butter right now, is comparing and contrasting the uh, different values and uh, uh, things that different data sources have to offer. Uh, this almost was a talk of its own. We can look at gaps, we can uh, identify duplicates, concordances, agreements, and conflict between different sources and what they have to say about the same things in the world. Um, look at data evolution and honestly a whole lot more. So how does this kind of uh, differentiate from uh, some other similar solutions that other companies have. One is uh, scale, and particularly interesting to me is the interesting signals we have as Microsoft, and uh, particularly as Bing, looking at how uh, people use, uh, search this information, um, what is, and what's really relevant. Um, going into the future, uh, what I would hope from something like this uh, is kind of a centralized mapping between all these open data projects. Um, there's a lot of richness out there that, you know, all these projects have their own uh, purposes and their own angles at looking at the world. Uh, and I think connecting all those dots can really lead to uh, a richer map for everybody. 
So uh, if there's questions, feel free to save them for later, or there's an email up there. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Tim. Next up is, oh, yeah, Mihai is talking, going to talk about conflation. Five minutes. In five minutes, that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> okay, take it away. No, no extra stuff on the screens. Hi, everyone. I'm Mihai from the Map Analyst team at Telenab. And uh, in the next five minutes, I'm going to do a quick overview of uh, a tool that we use internally, it has been developed internally and it uh, helps us to compare external data that we find with uh, the USM data. Right on. So I'm pretty sure you've heard about conflation on all that jazz. So basically it's, it's, it's the act of um, comparing, uh, um, of merging two data layers in order to create uh, one, a single data layer uh, that contains both uh, both uh, attributes from the input layers. Uh, so this is what Cygnus does. So it's a, it's a tool developed internally, as I said. Uh, it compares the two data sets, I mean, an external, an external data and the OSM data, and it gives you an XML file that you can load in JOSM and edit based on it. So just to highlight, so no, no, SM data, no OSM data are, uh, is destroyed or degraded or anything like that. Right. So a bit of the workflow. Uh, so you, you feed Cygnus with uh, an external, da uh, external data file and then a translation file, and it gives you the XML file. Um, one thing before, before feeding everything into Cygnus is uh, you better watch out for the license. I'm not going to get into that too much. Uh, the license of the external, uh, the external file, uh, so it should be comp compatible with the, the OSM data. Right, so this is a screenshot with uh, the, the, the translation file. So in this particular case, you can see that in the local data, we have uh, the ways named as expressway, freeway, arterial, whatever. And the translation is, um, the, the translation file uh, transforms these uh, uh, pieces of information into OSM tags, like motorway, uh, secondary service, and so on. And also for the one-way information. Uh, this is just a quick, a, a small example. So we have the local data uh, uh, a junction represented in the local data file as a, a dual carriageway. Uh, in OSM, you can see that the north-south way is single, uh, single carriageway. And what basically we have after the whole Cygnus thing, we have the, the, uh, the, the difference, which is the, the, the north-south way, which is represented as uh, dual carriageway. Uh, what I wanted to also to mention, uh, inside the team we, we use a script so we can feed uh, a Cygnus uh, a shapefile with the external data, but we, you, can, you can also try to, uh, so to avoid the translations and all, all the things, you can, try to, you can try to play with Cygnus on improveosm.org, there's a link on, on that website and you can just uh, upload an external file and put Cygnus to work. That's all. All right, thanks. Yes, Sandra, you're up next. Spoiler alert. Yes. Oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Here, I'll let you take over. Right. All right. So um, I'm Sandra uh, from Mapillary. And for those who did not hear uh, my colleague Chris talk earlier this morning, uh, we are a collaborative platform for uh, street level images and map data. 
And this means that any of you can upload geotagged images to us and then use these images as they are or to extract data uh, from. And all the images on, Map on Mapillary are available to OpenStreetMap. So I plan to talk um, about our computer vision and OpenStreetMap tools. But given the recent challenges that we have in the world, I wanted to spend uh, my four minutes, which I guess I have left, uh, on collaboration and um, how collaboration and partnership can help the development of disaster relief. And now I'm going to, I know it's late, I'm going to need a little bit of help from you, and this needs to be quick. So the next images I'm going to show, I need you to shout out and tell me which place, where we are in the world. Does anyone guess where we are now? Florida, yes. Now, Dominica. And here I'm going to show two. <laughs> this is Northern California. This is uh, Santa Rosa. And the last one, anyone guess? This is Mexico City, yes. So all these are images from uh, recent natural disasters. And uh, I guess all in this room knows that the ground perspective can be very helpful um, when doing mapping and also, of course, in uh, disaster mapping. And this is where street-level images comes in. The tricky part with street-level images is that you can't get them from space. And until we have solved this whole self-driving car thing, there needs to be human going out capturing these images. So, and this is where the beauty of uh, collaboration comes in. So today on Mapillary, we have uh, more than 200 million images that most of this is actually contributed by uh, individuals. But there is parts of it that comes from cities or governments or commercial actors. Some have interest in OpenStreetMap, some have not. Uh, and I wanted to show, I wanted to highlight two um, commercial actors has been contributing to, uh, to Mapillary. And this is probably, I should say, that this... Um, this section is not sponsored by uh, Microsoft, even though it might seem, <laughs> seem like it now. Um, so Microsoft is one of the um, commercial actors has been contributing uh, pre-disaster images of Florida and Texas to Mapillary. And all these images are also available now to, to OpenStreetMap. I think it's in total 11 million images. Another company is uh, Compass Data. They have been out capturing after the hurricane with a professional camera rig, so we now have 360 images of parts of, of Florida. And as soon as these images hit Mapillary, they're also available uh, on OpenStreetMap. And while I really want to acknowledge the value of these, um, of these contribution, I want to encourage everyone, and especially the um, commercial players who has an interest in improving OpenStreetMap, and to, to share the images if you have street level images, to share these images on a collaborative platform. Because it will not only make the map better, but when the day comes and if a disaster strikes, then these images can help the work of uh, disaster relief that can actually help to save lives. Thank you. Can I just say that you're also modest with your time? <laughs> I Min mean, is next with um, thousands of maps. Oops. Oh, I'm doing stuff away here. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ming Nguyen. Uh, if you caught my lightning talk yesterday, you'd think I spent my whole day leafing through phone books. But in fact, I. Uh, I work for Mapbox as an iOS developer. I work on map and navigation SDKs. So uh, think about the technologies you've heard about during this conference this weekend. Uh, I wonder, you know, a, a lot of them probably don't work so well on phones and tablets. That's, this is kind of a weak spot for, uh, for the OSM ecosystem. Uh, why does it matter that these things work on, uh, on mobile devices? Well, it matters because people uh, look at their phones first. They look at their phones before their computers or instead of their computers, especially when it comes to the most basic use case for maps, navigation. And so a map that doesn't work well on a mobile device might as well not exist. 
uh, a mobile developer has a cacophony of uh, decisions to make when they're developing their application. They choose their platform, their language, whether to go native or hybrid, what dependency man manager to use, um, whether to use design tools or do everything code, etc. And so choosing to use a third party uh, map library uh, that's powered by OSM perhaps is just another decision they, ha they have to make. Uh, so at Mapbox, we want to see OpenStreetMap used widely, and so it's on us to make sure that our libraries work with as many of these combinations as possible. Uh, because a, developer, a mobile developer, once they've decided to use their, uh, to put a map inside their application, they've already made all these decisions. So, you know, we're not able to, let's say, you do some of these things, you know, make, you know, choose like CocoaPods because you want to use a, an OSM-based map. That doesn't work. Um, so uh, in order to support a lot of these combinations, but still deliver a consistent experience across them, uh, we, we uh, share a lot of code between the different platforms. Uh, so this big green blob here is our core code in C++. That's used across all our native platforms, uh, so everything except the web. Um, and uh, that powers uh, like the, the very low level stuff, like downloading uh, tiles and rendering and things like that. Uh, and then there's the platform specific code, so the, the orange blobs on top. Each of those orange blobs is very different, but they all accomplish the same things. Um, so one of those things is that we try to provide idiomatic APIs. What that means is, uh, and say an iOS developer, they, uh, they're, they're focusing on interesting things in their application. They don't want to have to know exactly what a zoom level is, but they still need to be able to use a map, or put a map in their app uh, successfully. Uh, it needs to be intuitive. Uh, we're also taking the web browser out of the picture for a lot of these platforms. Um, we're talking directly to system APIs. And that allows us to improve speed and battery performance and also integrate more tightly with the system for features like uh, responsive gestures, uh, for drag and drop, for screen reader support and things like that. Uh, and also for GPS tracking, which is pretty important for mobile use cases. So this is what we're up against, zero. This is, uh, this is what it costs to embed, say, Apple Maps in an iOS application, or uh, how much it adds to the size of an Android app if you integrate Google Maps uh, the Google Maps SDK into your application. So um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a, kind of a uh, difficult barrier to make OSM-based libraries enticing to an, uh, and, you know, general uh, developer population. Um, so if we can't compete on those fronts, how do we make OSM enticing? Uh, we focus on customizability, on flexibility. Um, so let's say, uh, well, and so vector tiles really makes it possible. And it's not just vector tiles on the server, but uh, also bringing it down to the client. Uh, so let's say you're uh, developing an iOS application and you want it to be used out in the mountains over there. Uh, well, self-service is a luxury out there, and so maybe you want your users to download the maps offline first. So that's one thing that's possible with open data from OSM. Another is um, that, uh, okay, let's say you want it to uh, uh, emphasize the trails when you're on the trail and go kind of a dark color scheme when, it, uh, when the sun sets. Uh, instead of downloading raster tiles three times over for the same area, download the, the vector tile just once for the same area and then apply three different styles. Uh, so it turns out that the same vector data that renders the map data uh, in standard use cases is also useful for non-traditional purposes. So here's a demo of, um, oops, so here's a demo of uh, VoiceOver, which is uh, the screen reader built into iOS. So the ma same vector tile uh, data is being used to, um, well, this movie's not playing, but it's being used to read out the names of each of the POIs you see on the, on the screen and also all the roads. Um, so uh, this, makes, this makes sure that um, uh, blind and visually impaired users get access to the same information that a sighted user gets. Uh, we're also making OSM data accessible to game developers, mo mobile game developers. So this is a demo of uh, 3D terrain on someone's dinner table. And this kind of thing is actually the bread and butter these days of augmented reality um, uh, applications using our um, Unity SDK and augmented reality frameworks such as ARKit and uh, ARCore. And it's, it's the bread and butter of, these, uh, of this technology because uh, OSM data is open. It's, it's the, like the most obvious use for these technologies. So that's viewing the map, but when it comes to editing the map, uh, how, do we, how do we contribute back? Um, so yes, there are editors you can download, but what about people who are just casually looking at the map and they see a problem? We wanna make sure that they are able to, uh, to contribute back to OSM uh, because we're putting these maps in front of a very wide audience. 
So every Mapbox map comes with a, uh, a um, map feedback option, map feedback UI. And that just makes sure that um, you know, no, matter what, no matter who you are, what you're doing, if you're not even comfortable using a phone, you can still, OK. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, please visit our, <laughs> yeah, I, I got that gesture from, uh, from my, my China here. So yeah, thank you. Uh, please visit our booth. Um, we've got uh, a, a Unity demo going and also um, a screen reader support demo going. Thank you. Thank you, Min. Improve our sim is next. Beata. Let me just take care of that. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Beata from Telenav, and today I will talk a little bit about the Improve SM JOSM plugin. Do you know what is Improve SM? Did you use before? Okay, beside Martin. <laughs> okay, so uh, the Improve SM is a suite of tools that exposes the results of a massive data analysis, comparing huge amount of GPS data point with OSM data. JOSM plugin uh, is a plugin that highlights areas where roads, parking spots, one-way attributes, and turn restrictions are missing from the map. The whole project started as a Learning Friday project where we uh, was thinking about how to find uh, roads that are actually missing from the map. Then we took uh, the large amount of GPS data and overlaid with OpenStreetMap. And after uh, several weeks, we noticed that besides uh, missing roads, we also found missing uh, parking spots, missing uh, pets, and whole neighborhoods. First, we had uh, exposed to the OSM community the missing roads in 2015 September as the missing roads plugin. Then the next month, we do some analysis uh, regarding missing one ways. Uh, this uh, data was exposed throughout the traffic flow direction plugin. Uh, also in 2015, in December, we unified these two plugins and we released the Improve OSM plugin. And this plugin also included, besides missing roads and traffic flow direction, a layer uh, containing uh, missing turn restrictions. And here is a short demo about, about the tool. So the Improve SM plugin can be installed through the JOSM plugin menu items. After you install the plugin, you need to restart also the JOSM. Uh, uh, the plugin consists of three layers, the missing roads layer, turn restriction layer, and one-way layer. Each of these layers can be deleted and then re-enabled through the imagery layer. Uh, the plugin also has a corresponding Improve OSM uh, uh, window. So the missing roads layer uh, at a high zoom level uh, displays uh, red clusters. And as you zoom in, you will be able to see missing tiles. Uh, missing roads can be filtered out based on the status of the tile and based on the type of the data. Um, we have also some data for Denver here. And now I will show you two examples of missing uh, tiles. Uh, when you use the Improve SM plugin, it's uh, recommended to double check our result against several satellite imageries. And each of these tiles can be selected throughout mouse click. And on the Improve SM uh, details window, you see some details regarding the tile, such as the date, how many trips passed that uh, tile, and how many points, and also the type. Uh, these tiles can be selected also by mouse drag, and this is usable when you want to close or invalidate several tiles. So uh, each uh, of uh, these layers have some actions. You can see on the bottom of the window, you can comment the tiles, solve the tiles, invalidate the tiles, and so on. Uh, and now uh, I'm showing another example from Denver that is actually missing from the map. As you can see, I think this is a construction zone and some of our drivers uh, went through that, that uh, area and the uh, missing roads tool cached the missing area. Okay, the next uh, layer is the turn restriction layer. 
So turn restrictions are illustrated by uh, blue clusters. This layer can be filtered based on uh, status and uh, priority. Uh, okay, this is an example from Spain for uh, the third restrictions. We display the from segment to segment and the turn point. Uh, when you add turn restrictions, it is always recommended to double check against uh, available street view imagery. You can use either mapillary or open street cam. Um, okay. As you can see here uh, on the street, there are markings and you can go only straight, so you can't take that turn. Uh, for the turn restriction, there's also some details displayed there. And the last example is about uh, uh, missing one ways. So the traffic flow direction layer um, can be filtered out based on status and also uh, confidence level. And I think he's, this is an example from Toronto. Also for this layer is recommended to double check against uh, street view images. Okay, and also in this area we have uh, data from OpenStreetCam, and uh, you can see that um, in the streets uh, the, uh, the no car is going to the opposite direction. So here are some statistics regarding this tool. As you can see, we have uh, uh, many missing roads still to map, also one ways and turn restrictions, and the most used uh, layer is the missing roads layer from the plugin. Uh, what's next for the plugin? Currently the plugin is under maintenance and we are supporting new JOSM versions. As you might know, JOSM is under massive refactoring and with each release, uh, classes get moved uh, from one package to another. Uh, we've worked a lot on updating our algorithms and soon we will release new data for the one ways and turn restriction layer. Um, here are some sources. If you would like to use our data, you can download from missingroads.scobbler.net uh, slash dumps. We are doing daily data dumps. Uh, uh, the data dumps are in CSV format and you can use uh, whatever you want. And this is all. Well, thanks. Now, Dimitri, you're uh, last. My five minutes of fame. Well, this is your chance. Take, <laughs> take it away. Oh, wait, here's that annoying thing again. Uh, it goes away. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dimitri, and I want to give you like a small update uh, what happens in, uh, in OpenStreetMap and uh, particularly how we map uh, 3D uh, things like 3D buildings and uh, such stuff. Uh, so our cur current approach is uh, let's make uh, very small pieces of the building and uh, combine them together with a uh, height adjusted and uh, get something like a big building. So there is kind of a disadvantages of uh, that approach like uh, it looks like we try to build Taj Mahal out of sticks, and uh, it's like it's actually not what bothered me uh, mostly about that. Uh, we also don't use the data model as it's supposed to be used when we do such kind of mapping, and uh, so on. Uh, Another thing, uh, we have a quite old uh, way uh, to, to represent the data to export uh, OSM as uh, 3D models. It's called OSM to World. Uh, it supports uh, like most of the features from the simple 3D buildings attribution tagging schema. If you ever open <laughs> that wiki page. Uh, it's open sourced and it already has uh, OBJ exports. So uh, what I wanted to make uh, 
OSM to world be capable is to use the external OBJ models because there are quite few of them. Uh, you can find uh, OBJ models for most of the like hi highlighted places over the world. And also, uh, like on the last Google Summer of Code, uh, there have been a project which uh, utilize uh, the warehouse for 3D models. So now we are able to like store the 3D models and connect them to objects in OSM. Uh, it's still underway. Uh, you can take, um, you, you can try it. Uh, it's uh, in a separate fork on my GitHub account. Uh, later I will give you some more links uh, where you can take a live demo of, of how that works. Uh, so yes, uh, there is a building, it's a school. It's how the schools looks in Russia. And uh, that's how it looks in the uh, OSM2 world. You might see that uh, there is some work still left to do. Like for now it's a collision into the other buildings. Uh, that's actually like because uh, the reference point, the zero, zero point inside the model doesn't uh, like uh, not equal to the zero point of object in OSM, so we need to make some adjustment. It's more actually about how we want to store metadata about 3D model and how we want to store metadata about OSM objects, so it's more about tagging it's uh, not the problem of uh, OSM2 world, to be honest. But it has uh, textures. It has uh, the external model import. Uh, it, in the OSM data, it's just a link to the OBJ file, uh, nothing more. And it's proxied and so on. Uh, and uh, if I still have a little bit more time, I also want to share. Yeah, OK, I have one minute. There's also another cool project, it's called Cesium. It's a 3D globe made uh, with uh, WebGL. And uh, I also have uh, an uh, expert tool which can generate 3D models for Cesium out of OSM2 world. So we kinda on the way to get real 3D models like downloaded uh, as we go uh, with external models inside web browser on a 3D globe. So that's my five, point, <laughs> five minutes and five points. So thank you. All right, thanks all speakers. Another nice um, diverse session of liking talks. Um, what are some of the questions out of the audience for any of the speakers that we've seen in the past 35 minutes? I'm in three, this place where I live in New York, 3D maps to impressive. Uh, I live in uh, Midtown, my heart, and I work in Midtown. It's very interesting, I know everything. Uh, this this uh, first uh, pink map, Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. Mm -hmm. This one, 3D map looks very flat. It's very <laughs> flat. Yeah. Uh, yes, it looks flat. Uh, because actually in uh, cesium it's uh, like it has layers uh, it uh, has different providers for 3d tile sets and it also has a different providers for 3d digital elevation model so uh, like uh, to have it uh, with a elevation with a terrain model you, you have to connect the 3D elevation provider, and uh, you also have to export uh, the data from the OSM2 world with uh, the same kind of uh, elevation provider. Then the OSM2 world will bump up your buildings, and there will be 
match the elevation inside cesium. So it, it's doable, but like you have a you have to have enormous amount of duct tape. But hey, uh, this is a question about the improve OSM plugin. Uh, what are some of the strategies for like generating these things with confidence? Uh, like for turn restrictions, for example, is it mostly just like number of trips that uh, like traversed a segment and then like number of trips that took a turn? Uh, like what are some of the strategies there? Uh, no, we are using machine learning for that uh, part and it depends on the confidence level given by the algorithm. And uh, the high confidence or the, I think it's above 19% and so on. And the confidence too is I think between 19 and uh, maybe 17% and confidence free is less than. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, sorry, I forgot how uh, your your name. Uh, how you store the links uh, to the OpenStreetMap data? For instance, how you keep the link on the Boulder City uh, inside OpenStreetMap? Because uh, one perfect day it might be like change the ID or change the type of the like it, it was just a way and become the relation, like multi-polygon. -poly How you manage that? So right now, uh, we're not, uh, these links aren't being put in, into OSM. Um, most of this is used internally for, for measurements, but we're looking at how it might, might open up. But it is all based on uh, effectively um, uh, matchings of external IDs. So that is how it's being based. That could be, uh, if, if ID churn became a, a noted problem, uh, there are other ways we might be able to tackle that, but as it currently stands, the output looks a lot like a, a TSV of external IDs correlating to the same, the same entity across map, map space, different maps, different data sources. Yeah, I, I just mean that it's not a bulletproof uh, because they just... Uh, the, the worst part that you don't know when they change, uh, not that just they change sometimes. Then we could run matching again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, I have a question about the uh, improve OSM again. So. Is there a certain uh, confidence that you could reach and not require a uh, human uh, confirmation because it seemed like there was a gap between the ones that were identified and resolved, like uh, only 10% were resolved for, for one of them, for example? Do you mean the validation of the categories of the confidence? Right, like so if, um, if you had a 98% confidence that a, um, a one way was wrong or a, uh, a term restriction was missing, is there a certain level you could reach to just add that from your, add that automatically without having a human uh, do that confirmation? Uh, I think there is possibility for this, but currently we are not uh, adding automatically. So when, bef uh, before we are releasing a new data set or QA checks, let's say, 20% of the results and to see if it's above 99% or it's below. And but uh, maybe for the future we could uh, rely to do something automatically. Because it seemed like a, there was a bottleneck because there were so many, like one was 20% resolved, one was like 10% and one was even less. Like, if I was reading that table right, between the ones you identified and the ones that had actually been taken ah, action okay. on. Is that correct that there's the majority had not been yes, resolved? Yes. Okay. And can you just sorry, one last question. Can you are there any other besides those three that you're looking at uh, uh at this moment no. Okay. Thank you. You become hard to see with a nice sunset. <laughs> I don't see any more hands up. Last call? I think that I think that concludes the the Saturday even
Um, there's no more. There's no more sessions. Um, we have a social. Please stop by tonight. There, it's going to be. Um, where is it? Can someone help me out with that? Okay, S sitting. Sanitas Brewery. Yeah, it's in your program book, but um, it's it starts at I believe at 6:30. I'm horrible at. Uh, <laughs> making a public service announcement. 6.30, so please join us there. It'll be fun. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much for sticking around for the, for the late afternoon lightning sessions. They're a lot of fun. And uh, thanks to all the speakers as well. Thank you.